We're so glad to see you. This is a new year, second Sunday of the new year. Hard to believe, isn't it? And three months have gone by since we began our sabbatical. So this is, it's nice to be back with all of you on this second Sunday of the, of the new year as we just finished up our three-month sabbatical. And we've gotten back and met with our staff and had one week almost under our belt here. So we're delighted to see all of your smiling faces today as we begin this new year. I want to start with this passage of scripture this morning that we're going to put up on the screen because as I thought about our new year together, I thought what, what a great passage as we gather to worship him today from Psalm 66 verses 1 to 3. Would you read it aloud together? Let's read it together. Can we do that? Shout joyfully to God all the earth sing the glory of his name make his praise glorious say to god how awesome are your works and you know when you wake up on a day like this and you look out and you see how beautiful it is and we've had some rain and we've needed that and we can truly say to the lord how awesome are your works can't we and so we worship him, we praise him today. We're going to have a wonderful time together. We want to lift our voices. And as Ray comes to lead us, can I invite you, those of you that can, let's stand together. And Ray, come on up here. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year to each and every one of you. Here we are, another year. Praising God, giving him the glory. Holy, holy, holy. Because of Jesus, we know who we are, and we know whose we are, and we know where we're going. Blessed assurance, that's my blessed insurance. Oh 
glory, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descend him, bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his good lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And we thank him. We thank him for everything and in everything, in all circumstances. Thank him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me great salvation so rich and free thank you lord for saving my soul thank you lord for making me whole thank you lord for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and I come to the garden alone I'm just going to start that first line over again I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses And He walks with me And He talks with me He tells me I am His own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me Within my heart is ringing And he walks with me and he talks with me He tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known 
I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling But he bids me go through the voice of woe His voice to me is calling And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Let's go ahead and uh, find a seat once again, and I want to just uh, tell you a little bit about what happened in our lives in the last couple of months, and I want to say good morning and uh, to those who are watching on uh, television over at Town & Country today, those of you who are also watching the service online for the last three months, Joy and I have been on a sabbatical, and this is our first Sunday back, and so it's been so wonderful to connect with many of you and some of you we've seen during the week. But I want to just tell you, during the last three months, we had a wonderful, blessed sabbatical time. It was tremendous. Joy and I felt like we were able to unplug. But you know what was so surprising to us is it took us a while to get unplugged. You know, because when you're used to doing things and you're on the go all the time, right? I bet this was true, John, for you. When you unplug and step down from being chaplain, it takes a while for your body and your mind to kind of sync up with one another and to realize that you don't have to be on that schedule right now. And so we truly had a chance to rest and settle in a little bit. And we took some trips. One of the trips we took is we went to Washington and visited a number of friends of ours from uh, our church in Washington where we were for 16 years and it was so good to meet them and, and see them. And then we took some little day trips around, you know, as we can do here in Southern California. Oh, and, and I did a little bit of reading and uh, I thought you'd enjoy seeing, uh, I made a little list of some of the books that I have been reading during this sabbatical time that we're gonna put on the screen. And there's an interesting theme as you look at some of these books up there about what they have to do with. A lot of the books that I, that I focused on reading about was how to finish life well. And I thought, you know what? That is so appropriate because we're all interested in that as part of the legacy ministry here at Celebration Church. And as Joy and I have entered into what I call the third third of life. You know, life can be divided into three-thirds, all right? We're in the third, third of life. And one of, the, one of the books I thought was interesting, you might get a kick out of this, notice the third one down, Full of Years by Sap. Isn't that good? The scripture talks about how those of us who walk with God, we get into our older years, our latter years, we will be green and full of sap. That's a good thing. So anyway, I just had a great time reading a lot of these books and, and just helping to get a vision for what should this last season of our life really look like? What can God do? What can that be like for us? We know there's a lot of challenges, a lot of changes, but what does God want to do in the midst of all of that in our lives? And so that's what I've been reading and thinking about, and we'll share a lot of this as we 
go along throughout the year, things we've been learning, and hopefully it'll be, it'll be helpful to you. But before we left on sabbatical, those of you that were here with us, you may remember we were in a series from the book of Philippians. And we want to continue that series this morning. Remember, we, we called that series Turning Obstacles into Opportunities. And I, and I love that theme because no matter what life throws at us, no matter how many obstacles and difficulties lie in our path, God wants to turn all of those things into opportunities for us to grow and for Him to be able to receive the glory. And so I'd like to invite you this morning, if you have your Bible with you or your phone, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. And as you're turning there, as you're getting ready, let me ask you a question. What is your philosophy of life? How do you view life? If you could put into one sentence... How would you describe your approach to living? What would it say? How would it read? How would you describe the way you attempt to live your life? For example, the Greeks said, Be wise, know yourself. The Romans said, Be strong, discipline yourself. The religious might say, be good, reform yourself. Epicureans might say, you only go around once in life, so enjoy yourself. So what is your philosophy of life? How do you view your life here on planet Earth? Let me give you a couple of more examples. Education might tell us, be knowledgeable, expand yourself. Psychology would suggest be confident, assert yourself. Materialism would say be self-centered, please yourself. But what would Jesus say? If we were to ask Jesus, what is the central meaning of life? Why are we here? What do you think Jesus might say? What would his answer be? How would he describe life and how he lived it? This morning, I I want to introduce you to something Jesus did say. It's in Mark 10, 45. How did Jesus describe his philosophy of life? Here it is, Mark 10, 45. What did Jesus say? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In other words, if we were to ask Jesus, what is life all about? Jesus says, it's not about living for yourself. It's about giving yourself away to others. In fact, Jesus might describe it this way. The way up is how? The way down. The way you become great in God's eyes is you learn to serve. You go down. Now, that's not very popular today, is it? Jesus said the way up is the way down. The world says, tells us just the opposite today. And three people illustrate for us this morning, I believe the philosophy of Jesus, give yourself away. Today we're going to look at three people in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at Paul, we're going to look at Timothy, and we're going to look at a guy named Epaphroditus. Now, can you imagine naming your son Epaphroditus? That's a mouthful, isn't it? But these these three individuals, as we look at their lives this morning, help us understand how to improve our serve. Because remember something? If you're not dead, you're not done. In other words, if if you're still here, if God hasn't taken you up there, there's still work for you to do down here. If you're not dead, you're not done. And so we need to be, we need to understand how can we be better servants. So through the lives of these three men, we're going to look briefly this morning at how to improve our serving, our serving God, 
our serving of one another. And we're going to begin, first of all, with the passion of Paul. Philippians chapter 2, would you notice with me verse 17. Paul says, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Now, what's Paul talking about? Paul is describing his life as a drink offering. The pagans, when they, when they made animal sacrifices, as that sacrifice was, was burning on their altar, they would often take a cup of wine and they would pour it out on top of the sacrifice and there would be this hissing, sizzling sound as the liquid was evaporating into smoke. It would go up into the air. Paul says, that's how I view my life. It's as a drink offering being poured out. Paul says, my life I pour out for you Philippians, and I'm willing to do it. I am glad to do it. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, And verses 6 through 8, there's a similar analogy that Paul uses. He's at the end of his life as he writes 2 Timothy. But notice the same theme appears in his writing at the end of his life. He says, for I am already being poured out as a what? A drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, what does he look forward to? There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, but also all who have loved his appearing. Paul says at the end of his life, I've seen my life all the way through as a a drink offering that's being poured out. There's that sizzling sound. His life is being consumed, but it's being used and consumed with purpose and meaning and fulfillment. Now, here's the point I want you to get this morning. This is our first fill-in today. From the passion of Paul, we see this. Sacrifice without complaint. As we look at the life of Paul, we're going to see this right here in verse 17. What was Paul's attitude? I'm being poured out as a drink offering, but in his sacrifice, he served without complaint. He offers his his service to the Philippians without grumbling. How about you this morning? Do we ever get a little grumbly and uh, a little upset sometimes when we have to do certain things in our service for the Lord? How do we improve our serve? First of all, we need to check our attitude. Am I doing what I'm doing, whether it's for the Lord or for others? Am I doing it for the right reason and with the right attitude? Ever find yourself thinking, why do I have to do all this? How come nobody else is helping me? They don't even appreciate what I'm doing. Nobody ever thanks me. Ever had thoughts like that run through your mind? Of course, we all have. I have too. But as servants of God, we have to watch our attitude. I was talking with a missionary that was in our former church. And they served for 14 years in Kazakhstan. Now that's way over. Used to be part of the Soviet Union. And if you look on a map, you'll find it's not over only on the other side of the world. It's up, kind of up and towards the north. And it's a pretty cold place. And I was talking with this, this missionary, and they've just gone back to Kazakhstan again after being in this country for some time due to health issues. And I was reading his newsletter And they were commenting on the fact that serving in Kazakhstan, the weather, the temperature, the thermometer, the the morning they wrote this, was 40 degrees below zero. That's just normal life in Kazakhstan. 
And I remember thinking, and I, and I was talking to you about this, I said, you know, have you ever thought about sometimes missionaries, it's amazing some of the difficult and hard situations they have to serve in. Sometimes uh, things are very primitive. They may be very rugged, very difficult, very demanding, and, and often feels like, well, you sometimes wonder, how could someone sacrifice like that? And I remember asking him about that. And his name is Joel, and, and Joel made this comment to me. And this is, again, this is our second uh, fill-in this morning. He made this point. I thought this was so good. He said, God always gives grace commensurate with sacrifice. God always gives grace commensurate with the sacrifice that we are being asked to make. You say, well, what does that mean? It means simply that ministry, yes, it does involve sacrifice sometimes, but that God will always give us the grace, the wherewithal, to be able to do what the task requires as we depend upon Him. So on the surface, a particular job, a role of ministry, it might be hard, it might be challenging, it might be difficult, but with God's help, even our sacrifice is doable because we're not doing it alone, we're not doing it in our strength. Now, I want you to see in verse 17 here, look back and notice what's Paul's response to all of these sacrifices that he's making. Notice what he says, verse 17. Let's read it again. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, what was his response? He says, I rejoice hmm. and share my joy with you all. What was Paul's reaction to the sacrifice and service of the apostle? He says, I rejoice. The phrase there, the Greek phrase, I rejoice, is really a translation of privilege, the word privilege. In other words, Paul is saying, I feel privileged to allow my life to be poured out as a drink offering in service for you and for the glory of God. I feel privileged. In other words, he says, I feel fortunate. I'm blessed to be able to sacrifice my life for all of you. Now notice this third fill in this morning sacrifice if we understand it correctly here in what Paul is saying sacrifice isn't about what we have to give up but about what we have to gain it's not about what I'm leaving behind or what I'm missing out on it's what God is going to allow me to receive and experience one day two men were walking along a very treacherous path in the Himalayan mountains. Now that's cold country, folks. You bundle up there. And as these two men are walking along their path, they happen to notice someone lying in the snow. One man said, we need to stop and help him. The other man said, if we stop and help him, both of our lives may be in peril. I'm going on. The man bid his friend farewell, and he reached down, lifted the man's body, hoisted it up on his shoulder, and began to carry him along the path. After a few minutes, something began to happen. The heat of the man who was doing the carrying began to warm the body of the one he was carrying. And before long, guess what? These two men were walking side by side along this treacherous path when sometime later they encountered the other man who had gone on ahead only to find his body lying frozen in the snow Jesus said something about what happens when we sacrifice and what happens in return Matthew chapter 16 and verse 25 do we have that passage Jacob Matthew 1625 remember these words of Jesus for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will what find it discover it 
So in sacrifice, we feel like it's all I'm giving away. But no, it's not what am I giving away. It's what am I receiving in return? What am I finding in return? 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 4, Paul says something absolutely unique. Here's what he says. 2 Corinthians 7, 4. He says, I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy. When? In all our affliction. Isn't that fascinating? How could Paul make such a statement? When was he filled with joy when things were going well? No. He says, I am filled with joy. In fact, it's overflowing in the midst of hardship, affliction, and difficulty. Why? Because what we give away, God allows to come back to us in His measure. Sacrifice isn't about what we have to give up or what we have to lose. It's about what we have to receive. So how do we improve our sermon? Well, from the passion of Paul, what do we discover? That we serve, we sacrifice, but we do so without complaint. Because God is also going to meet our need in the midst of that sacrifice. But secondly, this morning, I'd like you to look with me at the priority of Timothy. Timothy. Would you drop down with me to verse 19? And Paul makes this statement. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Paul's writing to the Philippians. He says, I'm planning on sending Timothy back to you. Now, we need to understand something. As Paul's writing this letter, remember where he is? He's in a Roman prison cell, isn't he? Do you know how long it's been since he's been in Philippi? How long has it been since he's seen these people? Five years. He needs an update. These are his spiritual children. He wants to know how they're doing. So he wants to send Timothy back to find out what has been going on. And not only that, notice verses 20, 23 and 24. He says, therefore, I hope to send him, send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself will also be coming shortly. What is Paul telling us? He says, I want to send Timothy to find out how you're doing, but I'm also going to send Timothy because I want you to get an update on what's happening regarding my imprisonment. See, Paul had been in prison for some time. And he's waiting for some decisions to be made. And he says, I hope some decisions will be coming shortly. And Timothy will bring you news about how I am doing in return. Now, why Timothy? Why is Paul choosing this man to go back to Philippi to bring such news? And to find out how they're doing? It's because of his reputation. Would you look at verses 20 to 22 with me? Notice how Paul describes Timothy. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. What was Timothy known for? What was his reputation? In verse 20, it says he was known for one thing. His concern for others and their welfare. He cared about other people. Of all the people that Paul knew, this is somebody that stood out to him as an individual who was known for their care and their concern for how are other people doing. Now today, that is very remarkable. Because today we are living in a nation of people who are consumed with selfishness. I'm reminded of some of the things that we've been seeing, and I'm sure you have as well, on the news lately. Did you know that a reporter in San Bernardino once paid an individual to lie in the gutter of the street, on a busy street, just to see what would happen. How would people respond? Would anybody do anything? 
And do you know that he, he was lying there for an entire day for eight hours and not one person stopped to find out what was wrong with him? On another occasion, newspapers reported a man assaulting a woman on a public street and 38 people stood around or walked by and saw it happening and no one did a thing. Another occasion, some teenagers were walking by a phone booth. This will tell you it was a few years ago. But in the phone booth, they noticed a woman who was, who was slumped down in the phone booth and they knew something was wrong and, and they got into the phone booth thinking maybe she'd had a heart attack and they took her body and they went to the nearest home and they rang the doorbell asking to, for someone to intervene to help and what they got was simply a voice on the other side of the door is go away and get that body out of here. See, today we are such a self-centered society. People don't want to care about others or what's happening in others' lives. And yet, notice in verse 22 how Paul describes Timothy. Look at this. But you know of his proven worth. Proven worth. The words or phrase proven worth literally mean proof after testing. Proof after testing. Timothy had been tested many times, and his service to the Lord had proved of value. You say, how? Well, notice this, our next fill-in. Here's the lesson. From the priority of Timothy, what do we see? But selfless concern that leads to action. Selfless concern that leads to action. Timothy didn't just see a need He wanted to do something about it. He wanted to intervene. He wanted to make a difference. He put his concern and his compassion into action. This past Christmas season, here at Celebration, we try to put our concern for people into action. One of those is through a little thing we've started and done over the last seven years that Pastor Joel, our Spanish pastor, brought to us called Angel Tree. Angel Tree is where we are given a list of people who live right in our area who have children, but families where either the mother or the father are incarcerated, which may put a real dampener on their Christmas experience. And so we are given those names and those contacts and we invite them to come here to celebration and we're able to share with them gifts that we give to the children on behalf of the loved one who's incarcerated. And so we have a picture of uh, someone who even was willing to dress up as Santa Claus. This is Pastor Santa Carlos in the middle. And we were able to give gifts out and minister to over 45 families who were invited here to Celebration Church so that we could bless them and and, and meet a need in their lives that we know might go unmet if it wasn't for something like Angel Tree. Paul says, you know of his proven worth. He has served with me as a child serving his father. Now, I don't know whether you realize this or not, but we have a choice. We can either live by Philippians 1.21, or we can live by Philippians 2.21. We have a choice. We can either live for Christ, or we can live for self. Do you know what Philippians 1.21 says? For to me to live is Christ. But what does Philippians 2.21 say? For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. Are you living by Philippians 1.21 or by Philippians 2.21? We have to choose. 
And you know something? Just because you may be a resident this morning at Town and Country Manor does not mean that your ministry is over. It does not mean that your ministry days are behind you. Remember, if you're still breathing, there's a reason. If God hasn't taken you up there, there's something for you to do down here. You say, well, who do I minister to down here? Well, let's start with other residents. We've got people who have needs here. People who are across the hallway and live next door. And people that you're sitting across the table from. People that have needs. Have you ever taken time to pray for somebody with one of those needs? To share some scripture with them, to encourage them. There are residents who are needing ministry. But they're not the only ones. How about the staff? When was the last time you showed gratefulness for how the staff serve and minister to your needs here? How about encouraging them? When was the last time you asked a staff person, is there anything going on in your life that I could pray for? There's all kinds of needs, all kinds of opportunities to serve right here at Town & Country. Well, finally this morning, I'd like you to look with me at the profile of Epaphroditus. We're looking at three ways to improve our serve. First of all, have the right attitude. Secondly, turn that concern into action, as Timothy did. But notice what we learn from the life of Epaphroditus, verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Now notice three titles that Paul uses to describe this brother. He says he's a brother in Christ, means that they are from the same spiritual family, right? Calls him a fellow worker, same mission, same calling, and a fellow soldier. In other words, we've got the same enemy, Satan. They were co-laborers together. And Paul says, not only am I going to send Timothy back to you, but I've got another guy I'm going to send to you, and his name is Epaphroditus. And I'm going to send him back to you now. But Paul wants to remind his audience of a little of this man's character, of his dedication. This is absolutely amazing. Look with me at verses 26 and 27. Why send Epaphroditus back as well? Verse 26. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him and not on him only but also on me so I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy. Hold men like him in high regard. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ. Risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Let me just unpack a couple of ideas here in that passage. He says, I'm going to send Epaphroditus back to you because he longs to see you again. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says he needs to return to see you because he was distressed. And the word distressed there is a very interesting word in Greek. It refers to a feeling of deep anguish, being overwhelmed with anxiety, experiencing emotional turmoil. In other words, Epaphroditus was upset and emotionally distraught. Over what, you might ask? Would you notice what made him upset? It was not his distress about his own condition. He says, I'm concerned because I know you're concerned for me. And I know you wonder about how I'm doing. And here's here's a guy who not only went through things on himself, but he's more concerned not with his own distress, but with their feeling and their concern for him. He says, I want to give you an update. I want to tell you what's going on. Paul says that's the kind of guy Epaphroditus was. He cared more about you and how you felt about him than he did about his own problems. Wow. 
So what does Paul say? When he returns, give him a hero's welcome. Hold men like him in high regard. He deserves to be honored. Here's why, verse 30. Give him a hero's welcome because notice this. It says he risked his life. He risked his life. And the word for risk there is the Greek word literally that is a gambling term. It refers to the idea of a gambler throwing the dice, waiting for the outcome, risking it all on the outcome of the dice. Paul says, honor him because he gambled with his life. He put his life on the line for the cause of Christ and because of you. Here's the lesson. Here's the principle this morning. The last one. From the profile of Epaphroditus, we see servanthood is willing to take a risk. How do we improve our serve? By being willing to take a risk. By being willing to get out on a limb. You know what someone once said? Get out on a limb. Guess why? Because that's where the fruit is. There's fruit out there in the limb. And you know, it's so much easier, isn't it, for us just to play life safe, huh? Just to play it safe. Well, that wasn't Epaphroditus. In fact, did you know that soon after the New Testament was written, after the New Testament days were completed, there were a group of Christians who banded together and they were literally called the gamblers. Why? Because they were willing to go where no one else would go into dangerous places to care for people. In fact, did you know that in in the New Testament church, these gamblers literally took their name from Epaphroditus, the one who gambled, risked his life. They said, we ought to do the same. If he can do that, we can do that. And so when the city of Carthage, located in North Africa, suffered a severe plague in A.D. 252, and the pagan inhabitants were afraid of contagion, they refused to touch dead bodies, guess who went into action? The Church of Jesus Christ. They ministered to the sick. They were the ones who buried the dead bodies when no one else would. Well, that made such an incredible impact on the pagan civilization of their day that many came to Christ. Unbelievable. They gambled, they risked their lives, just as Epaphroditus had. I want to suggest to you today, don't end your life by just playing it safe. Take a risk now and then. End your, why not end your life with a bang instead of a whimper? Huh? Why? How do, how do we do that? How do we end life with a bang? How do we improve our serve? Three things this morning. We sacrifice without complaint. We're willing to put our concern into action. And just like Epaphroditus, every once in a while, we're willing to stretch and take a little risk. And you know something? For those who are willing to do that, God promises a great reward. I want to put this up as we close this morning. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. What a great passage. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you've shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. I want to send you out with these three ideas. What's the promise of Scripture today? Here it is on your outline. Number one, Hebrews 6.10. God sees. God is aware. God notices what you do when you serve Him. God sees. But God not only sees, He remembers. He not only notices, He doesn't forget. He'll never forget your service for Him. And then thirdly, God rewards. He blesses. He recompenses. I want to share this final illustration with you to wrap up this idea of how do we improve our serve and what difference does it make when we serve. A veteran missionary was returning home to the United States 
after several terms on the field. Aboard a ship bound for New York, a secularist challenged him, an atheist, by pointing out the futility of giving one's life in missionary service. He continued by noting that no one on board the ship was paying any attention to this missionary, a sign they apparently considered his efforts quite wasted. The servant of God responded, but I'm not home yet. The agnostic atheist assumed the missionary was referring to a large crowd that would meet the ship. And he scoffed again when they disembarked. Not a solitary person welcomed the missionary home. Once again, the missionary said, but I'm not home yet. A lonely train ride lay ahead as he made his trek from New York City to his small Midwestern hometown. Reaching his destination, the missionary could no longer fight back the tears as the train pulled off, again he stood there all alone. No one was there to welcome him. No one was there to celebrate his service for the Lord. But it was then that the inner voice of God's Spirit brought comfort by reminding the faithful servant, you're not home yet. Isn't that good? God sees. God remembers. God rewards all of our service one day when we get home. Well, would you join me? We're going to pray and we're going to conclude our service and we'll be dismissed. So let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you so much today for the illustration of these three men and what we can learn from them about how to improve our service, our ministry to you and to those you place in our lives. We thank you for this new year and the opportunity it gives us to be able to turn around and offer something of help and encouragement and ministry to others. Father, thank you for all that you're doing in our life. Thank you for where you have us. Thank you for the people you've placed around us. Show us, Lord, in this new year how we might be a blessing to others in our service, in our work, in our encouragement, in our prayers. Lord, thank you that you see, you reward, and you remember. And for that, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we'll see you back here next week. We'll continue on with our series in the book of Philippians. God bless you.